This is Dr. Charles Parker, and you're listening to Core Brain Journal. It's a place where I connect both fresh discoveries and interesting different perspectives from advanced mind science with the realities of real people and everyday life down on Main Street. Well, welcome aboard, folks. Dr. Charles Parker here another time. And we've had a number of people talk about coaching. This presentation today, this interview, this discussion with Kyle Davies in Cardiff, Wales, of all places, is going to be a very interesting conversation because he's got a different angle on coaching. He's going to talk to us also a little bit about chronic fatigue. So, Kyle, we're really looking forward to talking to you. Thanks so much for coming on board. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Parker. It's it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. So, folks, before we get started, I'm just going to read a little bit from our new sponsor, and that is Core Brain Journal is sponsored by Great Plains Laboratory. They are deep international biomedical testing leaders for improved, targeted mind science details. Who isn't interested in that? And as both laboratory and webinar global thought leaders, they provide the most comprehensive set of hard data measurement tools for real biomedical answers beyond guesswork. And they also provide multiple training webinars for both the public and medical providers on how to use that excellent data effectively. Check out their website for references and testing details and take note on this point. If you register for a complimentary test drawing this week, uh, the organic acid test, 75 specific testing answers from a simple urine sample will be selected out for the winner of that drawing. And the way you do it is you go over to HTTP Great Plains Laboratory.com forward slash CBJ. Hey, why not? Give it a shot. So Kyle Davies is a chartered occupational psychologist, a therapist, coach, trainer, and author. He is the creator, and this is what I was talking about a moment ago, of Energy Flow Coaching, which provides a framework and a process that can be applied to a health setting for eradicating symptoms. And this is what we're going to talk about, chronic fatigue and pain, anxiety, depression, and a workplace setting for improving engagement, motivation, creativity, performance, and clarity of mind. Now, that's going to be interesting to hear about how he does that in the workplace. So Kyle now works with individuals and organizations internationally to help overcome stress-related health challenges, increase mental clarity, reduce overwhelm. Who doesn't have overwhelm? develop inner resilience, inner resilience and flow, I should say, and improved performance in all walks of life. He's an associate fellow of the British Psychological Society and author of the recently published book, The Intelligent Body, uh, and that's by Norton Press, a very prestigious outfit. And Kyle has presented at workshops, seminars, and conferences in the UK, USS, USA, New Zealand, (laughs) and Europe has been a regular contributor to ITV Wales News and is the host of iTunes listed podcast, Unleashing Potentials. Now, that was the part I didn't quite read. Now, here's what's going to happen, guys. Instead of a book drawing, we're going to have a drawing. It's going to be here on the, on the website, and we're going to have it open for two weeks. And from that drawing, Kyle has said he's going to give away, and this is a very, very unusual for a guest here to give away a 30-minute coaching session with Kyle Davies. So you want to run down, when you hear this, run over to the website if you're in the car, put your name in, and give Kyle the test drive. He's going to be very interesting. I think you get it. Who gets a free 30-minute session? And Kyle, thank you so much for joining us and doing that that whole 30-minute session. That's a very interesting gift, and I'm sure you'll be really busy with that. Yep, I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> so right. I can entice some people in. You know, it'll be fun. You make it happen. Yeah, so, for today. so Kyle, you know, the interesting thing is to begin the narrative here, and that is this is deep. This isn't regular coaching. This isn't how you get your cognitive act together. This is a whole different level of thinking about human beings. And in this brief introduction, we hit workplace. We implied home. We talked about personal life. You didn't say it directly, but yeah. really there were, and to hit creativity, and personal evolution 
in so many different angles. It sounds very interesting. How did you evolve into that activity process? Into that beast? Well, that's a good question, isn't it? So to give the story of how I evolved, I started off as an occupational psychologist, which is the equivalent of an organizational psych over there in the States. So I worked in management consulting and did a whole range of things from exec coaching, management training, these sorts of things. I was particularly interested in the the coaching side of things, so I thought, I fancy a bit of therapy. I'm going to go and train. So I went and trained in a whole range of things, NLP, hypnotherapy, tapping therapy, counseling, CBT, the whole range. Started a little practice doing anxiety and those sorts of things from a primarily cognitive-based perspective. I then was introduced by a former teacher of mine, introduced to a medical doctor over here in the UK, and he had done a load of the same training as I'd done, and he had a particular interest in chronic fatigue syndrome. And the reason he had an interest in chronic fatigue syndrome was because his girlfriend at the time had it, and he had a deep frustration because as a doctor, there was nothing that he could do for her. So he had started to apply some of the, I guess, some of the ideas that he'd learned in therapy training, and he started to apply them to some of his patients. And he was beginning to notice that it was making a difference. So at that point, I was introduced to him, and we started to work together, and we started to evolve a process. Now, the process was largely based on the idea that emotional stress can ultimately lead to physical illness. And the thing I suppose that we were interested in was that sufferers of chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia would be conventionally offered cognitive behavioral therapy for their, you know, as part of a treatment package. And what is normally the outcome is that it doesn't make any difference. And in some instances, people feel a bit worse. In some instances, they may feel a bit better. But the idea was that CBT was working on this model that, right, well, your thinking leads to your emotions. So you need to change your thinking. And, you know, so obviously that's the fundamental at a simple level. That's what mm-hmm. people who practice uh, CBT do. And that's what I'd learned when I did a bit of training in it. And we felt that that model was not complete. We felt that there was something emotionally involved, but there was something before thinking, almost like there's a body emotion that, that occurs and impacts thinking. So we were having people attune to their emotion, to act on their emotion, to align with their, their emotion, not get involved in thinking, just kind of bypass thinking. And we were, we were noticing that when, they do, when people were doing that, they were, that was beginning to make a difference. So that's the, in terms of the start of how it, the work arose, that was kind of it. What we are beginning to see, and I think HeartMath, uh, the HeartMath organization in, in California, they're kind of trailblazers with this, with this sort of work. But they hi- highlighted this idea that emotional processing occurs at higher speeds than our cognitive pr- uh, processing. So, and it seemed to be something, as I began to look into the science of it, that seemed to be that, well, our emotion affects our thinking more than our thinking affects our emotion. So the ideas of CBT, of trying to change your thinking, especially in relation to the to fatigue and pain issues, is, it wasn't working. So that was the idea of evolving our emotion. I was also interested in the work of Antonio Damazio because his idea was that, or his idea is that our emotion and our feelings are slightly different. So the structures in the brain are slightly different. What he suggests is that his emotion is a non-conscious process that ideally will trigger feeling and then we feel something and then we act. Now, what we were aware of with sufferers of chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia was that they wouldn't feel a lot of their emotional feelings. In fact, they would have symptoms instead. And our hypothesis was that essentially what can happen is that it's possible for people to somehow unconsciously block their feelings but if that doesn't stop the body mind system producing emotions so emotions continue to be produced even when we're not feeling them and then what happens is that brain detects that emotion is being produced but not processed it's not transferring into feeling so we hypothesize that there is probably a a some form of rewiring of neural pathways that takes place within the brain which then in kind of really is a chain reaction so we have our emotion which kind of gets blocked if we don't feel it this leads to a rewiring of certain areas of the brain particularly the midbrain 
that in turn leads to some form of irregularity within the main systems of the body. So the autonomic nervous system, the endocrine system and the immune system. And that in turn then leads to the production of symptoms. Because what most people are used to with the medical paradigm of health is working directly on symptoms or maybe even trying to balance the systems and what we were suggesting was that well look what's happening is we've got a chain reaction that's taking place here that starts with a blockage of non-conscious emotion that's rewiring of the brain overactivity or dysfunction in systems and then symptoms we've got to come back and really teach people how to rewire the brain again by beginning to feel their emotion again so that's i hope that is not too that is terribly interesting i mean that that's such a great summary and of course while you're talking then me the psychiatrist i'm thinking about all these different manifestations of what happens because we see this happen all the time and some of our guests have commented on this uh, not exactly the way you put it because uh, they weren't as informed in this respect as you but Technique wise, they're doing some of those things. I don't know if you're familiar with accelerated response therapy. With the, not. No, no. We'll you, you want to know about this because you would be interested. It's right on the same level. And I don't have the numbers because I didn't know if we were going to get in this conversation. But you just put ART yeah. on Core Brain Journal. It'll come up. We have two different interviews from both the guy that put it together, and his name happened to be Kevin, Dr. Kevin Kipp. And he's had a support from the Department of Defense in big numbers of money and and has done a great job with PTSD and individuals who've been troubled that way. And he has a very specific way of getting around it without necessarily, he does kind of an EMDR technique without without even doing EMDR. Right. So then he comes in and he actually re, and I'm I'm just going to leave it to you to go back and, and, and see what he says because I don't want to try to summarize it. But really in simply, he has a different technique to do the same kind of thing you're doing and come up with a resolution internal in a very short period of time. Right. And it may be very close to what you're talking about. And then his administrative director, we interviewed her, Kelly Breeding, a couple episodes later, and she was very good. She was talking about places people can get training and all this sort of thing. But I think you guys would need to be connected because both of you would appreciate the work of the other person and, And uh, I think you're very much on the same path in certain respects. Yeah, that sounds very interesting. So let's take this a little deeper then. So if a person, the application of what you're talking about isn't just PTSD. This is a person who's developmentally arrested in some way and they can't get their act together in some certain context. It is, or is it really more in tune with PTSD? You tell me. If I'm honest, really, I mean, I've not really done much work with people directly with PTSD. I've had a number of clients with chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia that will tell me that they have PTSD-like symptoms. And it transpires that as we work on their, their pain and fatigue symptoms, their PTSD symptoms have dissipated as well. And I, I think it's, yeah, I th- I think it's probably the same, you know, it's, it's all connected. But I, I think it would be difficult for me to make comments about my work and PTSD directly just because I haven't done the numbers. I haven't seen enough people with it. Well, Ke- and you know, what I think about, Kyle, the thing is so interesting about what you're talking about is the direct relationship between the mind and the body in this situation because everybody thinks that chronic fatigue syndrome is just plain old intractable. In fact, over here, so many people think it's made up. They're just like, you know, hey, you're lazy and you want somebody to take care of and you don't want to work, basically. I mean, that's uh, being very reductionistic, but that's what a lot of people think. And, he's, you know, it's one of those. Actually, for me, that's the problem that we have with the medical model where born out of, of a desire to treat illness and injury, the whole idea of stress and emotion gets swept under the carpet. I think what ties mind and body together is the idea of stress. The very fact that I could have a car accident, I could have a bad case of flu, or I could lose a job, and the stress response in the body is exactly the same, makes us realize that, well, stress is stress. So from my perspective, I think probably all chronic health challenges are largely the same. I think that, again, we like to simplify things and I think this, again, is born out of the way medicine has worked. Medicine has, in its early days, wanted to see a single cause for a single disease and have a particular specific treatment for that. Mm. My belief is that there are 
probably multiple primary causes for any health challenge that's chronic. Mm -hmm. And my little kind of metaphor for this is having a stress bucket. For example, I had a couple of clients last year with fibromyalgia that told me their fibromyalgia was caused by a car accident. Now, for me, that the car accident was the final straw. And my little idea of a stress bucket is that because the body goes into the stress response, regardless of the stress or, we could have lots of emotion in there. We could have a bad diet. You could have a car accident. You could have poor sleep. And it all it's all building up stress. And then the body gets to some point where then it begins to have to produce some form of symptom. My work focuses on our, on our emotion because I think that the majority of people that I work with will be unconsciously blocking their emotion and they will have done so for the majority of their life without being aware of it whereas of course if they've had a car accident that's a one-off if they have a bad case of flu well that's a, a one-off as well if they have a poor diet that's a reasonably easy fix so having ingesting other toxins again it's a tangible easy fix but when it comes to identifying the patterns by which they are blocking their emotional truth as i would say that's a lot more complex and that's where we get into kind of the sort of the, the depth of things that's so interesting. Now I'm going to ask you a question that I know a lot of our listeners are thinking about right out there. And that is so many people are worried that there's going to be a cathartic experience. They're going to get completely unzipped in this process. They're going to embarrass themselves and they're going to get stuck in some regressive mode because the emotions that have been locked up or whatever the past is that has been locked up is now revealed and is now a completely terrible additional burden that they have to deal with that they really didn't have to do before. And if they hadn't talked to somebody like you, they would just be so much better. And this is something that I'm sure people are worried about. Can you tell us about your experience with that kind of concern and or that experience on your part? Yes. So for the most part, there's a very, I guess, simple approach that I take to working with people with symptoms. And it's a mechanistic perspective of our emotions. So the first bit of the answer is to say that, I, for the most part, I don't go into people's pasts. So I view emotion in, in a mechanistic way as a feedback tool from the body, in oh, much the same way as a feeling of hunger would be or a feeling of tiredness. So I view it as our bodies are sending us some emotional feedback today, tomorrow, and the day after. And what our body wants is for us to pay attention to that today, tomorrow, and the day after, and, and process it, act in alignment with it in much the same way as if I'm walking down the street and a stone pops in my shoe, I have a sharp pain in my foot. And that, that pain that's, you know, from, from the stone in my shoe is called, it's there for a purpose. So I look at emotion as serving a purpose in much the same way. You know, I, I, I talk about a, a true self. So the idea that we have this kind of core wisdom inside. And when we begin to deviate from that, that true self or that wisdom that is us, we experience some form of negative emotion as, as to alert us that we're, we're sort of off track. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that we necessarily have to talk about our emotion and it doesn't mean we necessarily have to go back into the past. So when I'm talking to clients, I'll talk about their medical history just to get an idea about the sorts of, of symptoms that they have. And sometimes clients will tell me about trauma that they may have experienced in, in the past. Often they don't. Often clients don't want to talk about the past. What I'm interested in is what they're experiencing now. Because if a client is experiencing some fatigue, some pain, even anxiety, depression today, it means their their intelligent body is trying to communicate with them today. So it means whatever patterns they're engaged in, whatever behavioral patterns, whatever the, the relationship with themselves patterns they have, they're exhibiting them today, which is why they're experiencing those symptoms today. So that's the idea. It's, it's, I don't go back into the past. And I don't do a lot of talking about emotion. It's really looking at it as a tap on the shoulder to alert us to, to do something in a slightly different way. That is significantly reassuring. I mean, it's really because if you think about that, and I'm sure you know this because you've had people coming in asking you kind of question I'm asking you right now because absolutely, absolutely, they yeah. just don't want to go back there and they don't want to relive it. I could tell you some terrible stories about individuals who I was working as a medical director in a hospital and I was with the Hospital Corporation of America. We had a very successful program dealing with stress and trauma many years ago before I 
knew anything. I was really a complete novitiate, but I was a psychiatrist coming in. And I knew enough to know that a girl had been raped in front of a motorcycle gang. And she had been in a different hospital. And what they'd done in the hospital, thinking that reliving the moment would then bring her some group support and she would feel better, if you can imagine that. So they wanted her to relive the entire situation in front of a group in where, out of Hosky, Alabama or whatever. And she completely fell apart. And she came in. The very first thing I said, look, we are not going to go over that again here. Do not yeah. worry about that. We're going to do, do what we can to bring you back together and get you together. But that is not, we're not going to re-rape you here. We're just not going to have it happen. Yeah. That kind of thing is, has been a standard of care, as you well know, because of the Absolutely. work you're doing. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is the thing, isn't it? I think this one of the things with my work and the way I define what our, our feelings are, what our emotions are, because people historically have thought of them as being something connected to the past and something that I have to talk about. And the idea that, well, if you think about it in, in just as a feedback, it's just trying to give you a nudge today and tomorrow and the day after. You, you don't have to spend a long time talking about it. Um, and that doesn't mean to say that you shouldn't talk about it because there are times when we do need to, but um, not to the extent that, that I think people have, have, have thought that they need to. Well, Kyle, I love that metaphor, a tap on the shoulder. I mean, how innocent and sublime is that? You know, let's pay attention here and think about the meaning of this thing. So very, very interesting and so helpful. Now, I have another question that I'm going to ask you. Uh, we're going to take a break here, but I have another question I want to ask you. You know, this sounds very reassuring on a lot of levels, but one of the things I think is so useful for clients who are thinking about this kind of thing or who want to help others who have these kind of problems, and by the way, when we get back, Kyle is going to tell us, I'm going to ask him to also tell us about his coaching training, which is another thing which is going to be on the show notes, but, but I think, Kyle, when we come back, one of the questions I want to ask you, and you're doing such a good job of speaking about this so articulately and so well and so completely understandable. What we like to do is hear about problems. When you have had a problem, so I'm going to ask you if you have had any experiences where you're going down the path and something unpredictable came up that would be at first a surprise to you and then what you ultimately got out of it and how it helped you reframe what you were doing. So a little bit about your own growth process in the process of paying attention to this. Yeah. So we'll be back in just a moment, folks. Today, the world of mind science, psychiatry, and mental health is rapidly changing with innovative, comprehensive testing that takes both patients and practitioners into a new world of measured details with useful, understandable, and remarkably actionable plans. The key phrase here is cost-effective. Testing also introduces a key parallel word, predictability. Psychiatric treatment failure, especially after multiple medications and our brief hospitalizations, arises directly from the complexity of measurable brain, body imbalances and impediments that explicitly interfere with medical outcomes and create costly difficulties with inadequately informed supplement and medication trials over time. Great Plains provides a leadership team of biomedical experts with advanced laboratory insights approved nationally both by the FDA and CLIA laboratory certifications and is available internationally for both public and medical professionals. Great Plains Laboratory is the primary laboratory we've used at CoreSight for years with excellent customer service for both patients and medical colleagues. They are on the spot. They get it every time. In addition, they provide exemplary training modules, which are webinars and conferences in an effort to broaden practice perspectives wherever you live. Do follow up on one of these complimentary test offers today at http greatplainslaboratory.com forward slash cbj. Yeah, that's Core Brain Journal CBJ. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. Mr. Kyle Davies from Cardiff, Wales. What a beautiful accent he has. He's so articulate talking about things that are just what we think of so often. I think of it myself, and I've, I've been doing this for many years, as almost untreatable. And he's giving us 
some new ideas about what we can do. So the question I was going to ask him and, and hope uh, to hear what he had, look forward to hearing what he has to say is troubles that have come up with his own practice that have been edifying to him where he's had something like, hey, this is the way I thought it would go. It turned out this way. And then this is what I got out of it. And here's how I can share that with the, the, the crew coming along. Do you have any uh, recollection? Oh, I do, I do. And I think that one of the things with what energy flow coaching is, is, is on a number of levels. So we look at the environment, we look at a person's interaction with, with their environment, and then it, the deeper level is their relationship with themselves. And the, that final bit of relationship with oneself came from working with clients, really, because to begin with, when we started doing this sort of work, we were having clients make behavioral changes. So it was the idea that, okay, if your body is presenting a, a symptom, it's a tap on the shoulder, it's trying to get you to do something different, it's trying to have you interact with life in a slightly different way in that context. And one of the things that we tried to, to say to clients was that, What's interesting is that the way the body seems to work, it's almost metaphorical. Is it, it, it seems that if it wants to get your attention with something, it will increase the, the intensity or the volume of the symptom that it sends. So everybody that I've worked with or have worked with, with chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia, it'll always begin with something much milder earlier in life. And symptoms often come and go in, in cycles, a little bit like hunger that kind of comes and then it goes and it comes back a bit more, you know, a bit, a bit stronger, a bit louder. All symptoms seem to work like that. So anyway, so I, we were working and I was working with behavioral change and then I was getting a number of people where they were making all sorts of changes in their lives, not necessarily big changes because I was never interested really in, in people making major lifestyle changes. You know, I was always looking for, for elegance, making mm -hmm. the smallest change for the biggest yeah. impact. Yeah. Yeah. But I was getting, a, so I was getting a proportion of people, they'd make changes, you know, in the way they dealt with colleagues, with family, you know, the, the sorts of things that they were doing in their life the sorts of tasks they were involved in and they were, they were noticing a difference to their symptoms and then I was getting other people and it wasn't making any difference at all and it became then apparent that there was something else going on and I needed to look much deeper and then that became it then became you know through a series of realizations I suppose that there was something about their relationship with themselves and I started to look in, into an idea of really our experience emerging from the inside out the idea that I suppose I, I had been in a space of thinking that life caused how we feel so my boss makes me angry. So if I can change my interaction with my boss, I can change the anger. And when people were beginning to make changes and they weren't, it wasn't making a difference to their symptoms, it, I began to get some sort of, I guess, insights into an idea that it's actually, it's not that life causes how we feel. It's not that that boss makes me angry. It's that my emotional experience emerges within me i conceive of my reality myself so rather than me necessarily fixating on outside life and having to change outside life i probably need to look at what's going on within me now that is coupled with one of the ideas i mentioned earlier that our emotional processing is because at high speeds and our cognitive processing what we know is that when emotion is triggered in brain and body our thinking centers light up if someone is in a paradigm of life directly causes how i feel which for the most part people are people assume that yeah, what's going on in life directly causes how they feel when they experience an uncomfortable emotion the thinking centers light up and they normally get stuck in a pattern of thinking about and, and focusing what needs to change out there in life in order for me to feel better in so life. true so true and it sort of occurred to me that it's entirely possible for a person to feel okay without anything changing in life and this you know i guess we've all had this experience of you, you can be angry one night you go to bed next morning nothing's changed in life but you feel different and it's almost like there's a bit of a, a reset that goes on so i kind of had the sense that this well, my, my and my current belief is that we have a sort of almost like a natural default setting where we are rather more aligned with what I would call our true self and where we feel okay. And a lot of the time what we do is we get in our own way by overthinking and by fixating on trying to change the external, we 
get caught up in thinking we produce a lot more uncomfortable feelings and we get stuck in this negative loop. When we do that, again, that's the re- our relationship with ourselves. So that, I guess, I hope this is sort of making sense. So that was the shift that I made of looking from, well, outside in to inside out. And so that chunk of energy flow coaching of having, of dealing with a person's relationship with themselves is beginning to teach them actually the creation of the conception of your experience comes from your reality emerges through you, from inside you. So rather than fixating on the outside, actually, if you come back to you, it's entirely possible that you could feel okay without anything changing out there in life. See, that is, no, it's very understandable the way you said it. And I think that's so, so true. It's funny because... You know, if you think back about what Freud did, I mean, he had some awareness of that, but he was chasing it in a different way. Yeah. Because he, had, he wanted to get a conceptual level of something in the past that was traumatic and then in some way achieve mastery over it by actually reliving it again through the transference. Yeah. So that, you know, if his patient is angry at the therapist and projects stuff on him that it isn't real, it's not real, it's transference. And really it's, he's carrying this burden from his past life. Yours is in a way much more uh, refreshingly simple in one way, because then the person only has to use these taps on their own shoulder to understand where they're going next, what they need to resolve, what the context, I'm guessing now about this part. So there is, is there an impediment from the outside world that does set them to this additional consideration or is it really almost completely independent of what's going on in the outside world? I would imagine the outside world brings them to you and their, their experience with the outside world. It's a combination. So we, th- th- there are things in the outside world that could be seen to be contributory factors. And as I say, it can be that an individual needs to make some changes in the way they behave in life. In saying that, in many instances of with people that I work with, it is about them really beginning to understand the nature of how their experience begins to to emerge. Going back to right at the start when you were saying about creativity, clarity of mind, those things naturally flow through us. So that's my notion is that what we tend to do, certainly in the West, is we clog ourselves up through excessive thinking. And when we have an understanding that actually my natural default setting is kind of to flow. So, you know, if we think, you know, there's been stuff that people write about flow state, Mm -hmm. when you're not in your head, when you're performing at your best, you're out of your head. And I think, you know, and generally the idea of, of when people talk about flow state is when somebody is performing at a high level. I don't think you necessarily have to be. So the idea of, of energy flow coaching is you don't necessarily have to be performing at a high level to be aligned with your own flow. It just means that you're in the moment. You're not in your head. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. when that happens, your decisions are better. You're more creative. Life seems to flow. Good things happen your perspective of yourself is more positive, your perspective and perception of life is better. When people shift out of alignment with themselves, what tends to happen is their perception of themselves becomes more negative, their perception of life becomes more hostile, their brain becomes more cluttered. Mm-hmm. And what, they, what people then try to do is rather than recognizing that I'm drifting away from the core of myself here, I need to just come back, be present. What they do is they frantically try to fix outside life, and they very often do that by thinking more. So the idea of overwhelm that you you touched on at the start, overwhelm is, in most instances, something that takes place in somebody's head. It's usually the head is is overwhelmed. So true more than it is the number of, of activities a person has to do. Because you could get somebody that is is connected and aligned to themselves and they're just flowing and they're very they're very busy and they're getting a lot of stuff done. And you can have somebody that is gets very little done. You know, I had a client last week and, and she said to me about being overwhelmed all the time and she's she has anxiety symptoms. And then she said to me, but she said it's really weird as I'm as I'm telling you now, she said, I've gone down to working part time. I'm working three days a week. She said but even on those two days off, I'm still feeling completely overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. She said, why would that be? And of course, people generally think about overwhelm as being connected to their activity, when in most instances, it's the activity of their thoughts. So that whole stuff of being creative, of flowing, for me, is linked to the extent to which a person 
is running everything through that mental channel. They're trying to overthink everything. And I guess what I try to teach people, as well as, you know, there's a part with symptoms of saying, well, symptoms are tap on the shoulder, but there's also this idea that you can trust yourself. And if you are natural tendency our natural default factory setting is to be in a bit of a state of flow it's like kids isn't it you know if you watch a, a child it can be happy one minute sad and it's happy again but there's no grudges and i know their frontal lobes are not developed so therefore they don't over beautiful state of flow where they they are they're just flowing and um, they feel everything they let themselves express what they feel so they process it what i thought was really cool kyle was the whole evolution of time. You were really starting to talk, without saying it explicitly, that time is a relevant factor in practice, that there are a couple of other things going on there other than just here and now in this circumstance and this life and this. And you really have to look at the larger picture. And really what I wanted to ask you about, and we could close with this question a little bit, is what does one do? How do you actually and this may not be able to answerable in a short in a short answer, but I'm thinking about the person who wants to do this, I'm sure this is in your book as well, The Intelligent Body. I think what's going to happen, and what I'm guessing is going to happen, there's got to be some way to practice this. Do you have a meditative experience? Do you have a specific tool set that you use to stay on this inward self-exploration journey? Or do you think it needs a co- how does How does all that work? Do you have any thoughts? Uh, so... It depends where a person is in their life. I, I think there's, I think the ideas of, of energy flow coaching is really a framework, some principles, and there are some exercises that fall out of that. So there are uh, a number of sample exercises in the book. And the book is designed really, I, gi- I guess, to give people some insight and, and, and a taster of what the work is, is all about. I don't see it as being exhaustive. I see it as being a growing field, if, if anything. But there are key assumptions, I suppose. One is that, I guess we've talked about a number. One of them is that it's entirely possible for emotional stress to lead to physical disease. Another one that we were just uh, talking about is that our conception of reality emerges from within us and through us so Mm -hmm. rather than our feeling experience being directly caused by outside life it's something that emerges within us yeah Uh, yeah. so those are two key pieces i think in terms of how would a person use this it's not a sort of a step one to ten and i guess because of the last thing i just said about our experience emerging from within us the idea is is that the work, it's empowerment focused. So it's, the, it's, it's based on the kind of notion that we are self-healing and self-correcting. So our physical body is designed to self-heal. Our emotional system does the same thing. Mm-hmm. And really what energy flow coaching is looking to do is nudge people back on track to their own healing journey, which mm-hmm. is really the idea, well, when you're aligned with yourself, if you have symptoms, your, back, your body will naturally heal. If you feel lost, overwhelmed, confused, then just again, coming back to yourself will facilitate the process of feeling okay again. So what I do is, is just take people on a journey back to themselves. And it's, a, it's always a process of unlearning the patterns of, of excessive thinking and, mm-hmm. and fixating on external life. And of course, the, one of the biggest things people do is they try to match themselves to some conception of who they think they should be. And it's sort of unlearning that, really. And I know a lot of these things are almost cliches of, well, you've got to be true to yourself. You've got to be, you have to be, be authentic. I suppose they're cliches for a reason. And it's not easy to do. So the process of, of energy flow coaching is to take a person back there. I think some people could do it by reading the book. Other people would probably need either me or one of my coaches. So let's close and talk a little bit about your coaches and training and how people can get a hold of you. Again, I want to apologize before we formally close about whatever broke up. The, we're going to stick these two guys together. I think it's going to work out. Our audience is a very forgiving audience. All they want to do is get the closure and figure out where they can go and what they can do next. So go ahead. If you could tell us a little bit about your coaches and, and your uh, plans in that regard. In the middle of, of training some energy flow coaches, so we have some in the States, we have some in Australia, some, some in, in Ireland, and obviously me in Wales. For people that would like to know more about either training to be a coach or for those who are interested in being 
coached or would like to go through this, this process. The website is energyflowcoaching.com. The book, The Intelligent Body, is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all good retail outlets. I'm available on social media. I'm on Facebook as Kyle Davies, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, all these places. That sounds great. Listen, uh, I'm going to just remind everybody, come on over to the show notes at Core Brain Journal. And in the next uh, two weeks from the publication, this is going to be published sometime in June, but you sign up there and get a free, if I can spit it out, 30-minute coaching session with Kyle. It's not going to be everybody. He's going to have a drawing and he's going to, he's going to factor that in. And thank you so much for offering that because I think it's really very cool. Nobody has really thought about that before. And and what more personal way to end up and say, listen, we're going to actually give something to you that you can try it on for size if you want to. And I think that's very generous of you, Kyle. And I want to express my appreciation again for you it's doing it. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. So uh, thanks very much. We'll be, and I'd love to talk to you again. I'm thinking offline when I was messing with the machine trying to get it to work out. Different people, I'm going to introduce you offline to some other people that you will enjoy. You won't be getting it till tomorrow morning, but... Uh, will be in, you know, some other people that would be of interest to you. So that would be great. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for coming on, Kyle. You have a great day. Thank you. And you. Thanks for listening to Core Brain Journal. We're working every day behind the scenes to bring you reports that connect research benches with those street trenches. Here we share the complexity of mind science because, as you know, details really do matter. One of the most pervasive misunderstood challenges is how commonplace medications like those written for ADHD are used so regularly without clear guidelines. If you think you'd like more specifics, take a minute to download my two-page PDF packed with video links and references on the absolute essentials of how to start ADHD medications. They're easily available at corebrainjournal.com forward slash start. Thanks for listening. Do connect and stay tuned. Together we can make a difference.